It is time. It's time to begin our class this morning. So we want to do so by welcoming everyone who's with us. Uh, we have visitors as I look out. We do have visitors. We're blessed again. And so we're always grateful for those who are visiting with us. If you're from the community, please come back and be with us. Uh, we'll be coming back tonight at 5 o'clock to study again from the Word of God. If you're traveling and you're with us because of that, we're thankful that you stopped here, that you're, again, participating with us in morning Bible class and in our assembly that will follow. For this quarter, we've been looking at growing. And specifically, we've been looking at 2 Peter the first chapter, verses 5 through 7. Now, as I've indicated in other studies, uh, we're also going to be expanding that next Sunday, looking at what happens when we lack these qualities and also what happens when we abound in these qualities. So we're not only looking at verses 5 through 7, but that's where we find the Christian graces those virtues that we are to add to our faith. It's interesting when you look at 2 Peter, the third chapter, verses 17 and 18, we really find two things. Peter emphasizes two things. First, do not fall from your own steadfastness. And secondly, but grow. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so at the end of 2 Peter, Peter says, don't fall, but grow. In 1 Peter 2, in verse 2, Peter gives us some insight relative to how to grow as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow with respect to salvation. And so it takes that desire. If you don't desire to grow, you will not grow. And so we see that we're not to fall, we are to grow. We're told how to grow. And in the context that we're looking at, we're told what to grow in, what to add to our faith. And so if you will, take your Bibles, turn with me again to 2 Peter, the first chapter. Let's read verses 5 through 7. Notice what Peter says, but also for this very reason giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Now, as you know, those who have been involved in this study, we're looking at that last virtue this morning, love. It is, as we'll notice, the crowning virtue, if you will. But let's go ahead and let's read the introduction together. Notice what we state in these few words. It says, having considered the other graces, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, and brotherly kindness, Peter now instructs us to add the crowning virtue of love. Lest brotherly kindness, Philadelphia, reduce itself to a selfish, narrow, or exclusive love, Peter directs us to possess a love that embraces all mankind, agape. Stop here for just a moment. We emphasize this last Sunday morning. That brotherly kindness, Philadelphia, as important as it is, if it stops there, if we just love each other, if we just have that brotherly kindness but no kindness for someone else, then again, we're stopping way short, way short of what God expects of His children. In fact, take your Bibles, hold your place in 2 Peter, the first chapter, Take your Bibles, look at Matthew 5. Jesus has something to say concerning this just loving, you know, those who love you. Look at Matthew 5, specifically verses 
46 and 47. Matthew 5, verses 46 and 47. Jesus says here, If you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax, uh, tax collectors do so? And then look at verse 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What Jesus has been teaching there is that God is good. God is kind. God demonstrates his love to all mankind because even the wicked partake of his sunshine. Even the ungodly, they benefit from his reign. And so God is good, he's kind, he's loving to all mankind. And so that's why this last characteristic, this last quality is so important. Lest we just say, yes, we're to love each other. Let's demonstrate brotherly kindness, but nothing to those outside. Love says, no, you love all humanity. You love all mankind. Now, let's go back to the introduction. Pick it up. Pick it up right where we left off. It says, agape is indeed more inclusive than Philadelphia because it's a love for, of, humanity. The richness of this love signifies active goodwill toward mankind in general. Let's prepare to examine the greatest need in our lives and in the world today. You remember the secular song a few years back, What the World Needs Now? <laughs> it goes on to say is love, sweet love. Well, that's what we're emphasizing this morning. When Peter says, add these things to your faith, he ends up with agape love. Love, love for all humanity. Now, I didn't ask this earlier, but does everyone have a handout? Raise your hand if you didn't get a handout. I noticed a couple walked back and, and received one. Raise your hand, it's gonna be hard to follow our study without the program in front of you. Anyone need a handout, please raise your hand at this time. Do I need one? No, I need two. <laughs> Randy's been trying to give me one the whole time. Okay, it looks like everyone has their handout. So let's begin. We're gonna have a word of prayer and then we're gonna go back to the handout and look at the definition of love. If you will, please bow with me at this time as we approach our Heavenly Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your great and your majestic name. Father, we stand in awe this morning having viewed your creation, seen your sunrise, partaking of your air that you've given us to breathe. Father, we know your goodness, we know your kindness, we know and have demonstrated, or at least has been demonstrated to us, the great love that you have for mankind. Father, as we have assembled this morning to study from your word, help us to really concentrate upon what Peter says by inspiration. Help us to challenge ourselves to add to our faith this kind of love that embraces everyone this active goodwill that seeks our fellow man's best interest. Father, thank you for everyone who's present this morning. Thank you, Father, for the interest, the zeal, the enthusiasm that brings them here. Help each one of us, Father, to listen attentively. Help us to add what we're studying to our lives that we truly might glorify you, that you might be pleased with us in all things. Holy Father, again, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his life. We're so mindful, Father, that as we look at his example, we see all these qualities in their beauty, in their wonder, in their splendor, and help us to walk more closely in his footsteps that we ourselves will add these qualities to our lives. Again, Father, thank you for this opportunity to study from your word 
Help us in our understanding. These things we pray in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Now look, if you will, at the definition. It's always important. That's why in our studies we've always taken time to define what we're dealing with. And so once again, the definition, begin reading it with me. It says in the Greek language, there are four words that describe our English word love. Eros expresses sexual desire or sensual love. Our English word erotic is derived from this Greek word. This does not appear in the Bible. The next word is storge which means family affection. Although this word is not found within the scriptures, it does combine with other words and expresses a love of family. Phileo is the next third Greek word for love. Phileo expresses the love and affection between friends. Thayer says it, quote, denotes an inclination prompted by sense and emotion. Linsky adds that phileo is, quote, the love of affection and personal attachment. The last word is agape. Agape is not an emotional, affectionate, or passionate response. It is the love of doing right simply because it is right. Now, let me clarify something here. I'm not trying to divorce emotion and feeling from agape. What I'm saying is it's more than that. It does involve the emotions. Uh, it, it does produce feelings, but it's more than that. It goes deeper than that. It is doing right simply because it is right. Loving our enemies. You don't get a warm, fuzzy feeling doing that. Sometimes we may even wonder why. Why does God teach us to love our enemies? But then after we do it, after we demonstrate love toward even our enemies, we begin to understand why. Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Luke 23 and verse 34. And so we're saying that agape love goes deeper than the rest. While it involves the emotions, it's not simply an emotional response. And so continue with me. Notice what we've said here. Agape love is not a mere feeling. It is not simply an emotion, but is rather a commitment of will. Underline that. Underline. That's what agape love is. It is a commitment of will. When God tells us to love each other, to agape each other, again, this is a commitment of will. This whole idea, well, I just don't love them. The Bible says, no, you're commanded to love them. It is a commitment of will. I'm going to love them because my Father in heaven has commanded me to. Well, pick it up again. It is a disposition of the heart, a mental resolve, and a consistent way of thinking and acting. And so think about what we've just said. A commitment of will a mental resolve, those are important when we talk about Peter encouraging Christians to add to their faith ultimately and finally love. Look at the next point here. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul's great chapter on love, he does not describe how a loving person feels but what a loving person believes and how they behave. Remember what we said? It's more than simply an emotional response. It's more than simply a feeling. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul doesn't get into how the loving person feels, but what he believes, and because of that belief, how he acts, how he behaves, what love does and what love doesn't do. Notice again, 
the next point here. Agape is a determination of the mind producing deliberate conviction and policy of life. The next one, Linsky's description is noteworthy in that he says, quote, love of intelligence, reason, and comprehension coupled with corresponding purpose. The next point, agape love is not a compulsory compassion, thus, I have to. This is not the kind of love that Peter is encouraging now. Just a compulsory compassion. I'm going to quote love because I have to, and that's the only reason. Now, it's more than that. Notice the next point. Agape love is not merely a conscientious compassion. Thus, I need to. Now, again, stop here for a moment. There is a sense in which, yes, I have to and I need to, but it's deeper than that. It's because we want to please our God, because we first love Him, and He teaches us to love others. And look at this last point here. Agape love is a Christ-like compassion. It is a love for the unlovely. Not like that. That's where we stand in one sense before God. Because of sin, we have made ourselves quite unlovely. But guess what? Even in that state, God loves us. God sent His beloved Son while we were sinners. And so God demonstrated that love to us. We need to demonstrate that love to others. A love for the unlovable at times, the unlovely. You remember, we put down the passage. Now, we're not going to go there and read it in Matthew 5. We've read part of it already this morning. But again, this is when Jesus is showing that the Father's love is so deep, it is so inclusive, that once again, he blesses, at least with physical blessings, even the wicked, even the ungodly. He sends his sunshine. He sends his rain. He cares about humanity. And again, that's when Jesus said, if you love those who only love you, you know, what big deal is that? Everyone does that. The tax gatherers do that. And so, but if we want to be perfect, meaning complete, whole, we need to love as our Father loves a complete love, a true interest and compassion for humanity. Not just brotherly kindness. Certainly we love one another. But it's a love that extends beyond this auditorium, beyond one another. We care about others. We care about humanity. Again, remember Galatians 6 and verse 10. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all men but especially those of the household of faith. So it's not only for the household of faith, but also for all men. A doing good, a mental resolve that we're going to do what is in the best interest for anyone, everyone. Any comments before we continue this morning? Any observations? Brother Paul? Okay. The, the depth of what we're talking about here, as Paul pro pointed out, we need to, quote, get it. We need to understand what God is teaching here. And again, I think sometimes, if we're not careful, we're sort of willing to pat ourselves on the back when we, when we love each other. When we love each other, when we sort of huddle in a group, <laughs> and it's us against the world... And with that kind of mentality, then we sort of hunker down and, and, you know, we're not reaching out like we should. We're not demonstrating true compassion as we ought because that person is not one of the fold. That person is not a member of the body of Christ. But again, love says they can be. 
we want them to be. We want to demonstrate the kind of love and compassion and kindness that would encourage them to be. You remember in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite, they walk by on the other side. They just didn't have the time. And more than that, what they lacked was the compassion. We've mentioned this on numerous occasions, but it's so, it's so worthwhile to understand. Like Paul, Brother Paul just said, you know, the priest, the Levite, they didn't, quote, get it either. Again, if everything's convenient, yeah, we'll show compassion. Uh, you know, if it's a person we like, yeah, we'll show compassion. But here's someone truly in need. Here's someone left to die. And the priest and the Levites see him walk by on the other side. The, quote, other side religion will not cut it. Jesus didn't walk by on the other side when he saw our needs. He came to this realm. He gave himself on a cross. And again, that good Samaritan, he felt compassion. He had love for this evidently stranger. Didn't do what he did because he knew the man. Didn't do what he did because it was a neighbor, a fellow Jew. Remember, this is a Samaritan. The Jews and the Samaritan had a great animosity towards one another. But that Samaritan got it. He understood this is a fellow traveler in life. He's on the same journey I am. We're occupying this same great realm. We're here in the image of God. And so here's a fellow man in need. What am I going to do? I'm going to demonstrate a love for him, a compassion for him. And so as Brother Paul says, yeah, sometimes we get it, but when it comes time to apply it, we don't want to get it. We don't want to apply it because it's going to demand something of us. Some of our time, some of our energy, some of our money. But again, this agape love is so very important. Stephen? Okay, very good. And this becomes, the more we become Christ-like, guess what? The more natural, quote-unquote, this becomes. You remember in Romans 1, Paul says they were without natural affection. Well, affection is natural. But again, it's what we've already said usually that, quote, natural affection just simply extends to loving those who love you, greeting those who greet you. That's easy. And as Stephen points out, what we really need to grow is in the compassion and love when someone makes themselves our enemy. Now what do we do? Now how do we respond? Again, when it's a person different from us. Are we filled with prejudice or are we filled with compassion? I know what the Bible teaches us to do. And so these are areas that we have to challenge ourselves to grow lest we just be like the world and go through this realm loving those who love us and that's about it. Turn with me if you will to John 15. I think it's John, the 15th chapter. Look at verse 19. We've already read a verse in connection with this mindset. But look at John 15 and verse 19. And you'll see that Jesus had a lot to say about this other kind of love. The love that only loves those who love you. The, the doing good to those who do good to you. Greeting those who greet you. 
Well, look at John 15 and verse 19 again. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You see what Jesus is saying? If you were of the world, the world would love you. Because that's the extent of the world's love. They play by the rules that if you love me, I love you. If you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. If you greet me, I'll greet you. But if you don't love me, I'm not going to love you. If you don't greet me, I will not greet you. That's the world's concept. But again, the Christian's concept supersedes that. The Christian standard is not what everyone else does, but what our Savior has done. We're to walk in His footsteps. We're to become more like Him. Now, look if you will. Look at this next point here where it says probing deeper. This is interesting to me. Notice it says, what important truth can we deduce from the following verses? Now, take your Bibles, follow with me to each one of these contexts. The first, Galatians, the fifth chapter. We want to read verses 22 and 23. And notice... Notice every one of these contexts is going to have something to say about love. The love that we're talking about this morning, agape love. Look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And so the fruit of the Spirit, it begins with love. Well, look at the next verse that we put down there in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 6. Look, if you will, at verse 11. Verse 11, Paul writing to Timothy says, But you, O man of God, flee these things. Now that these things he's talking about, he's just mentioned the love of money. Okay, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Again, love is mentioned. Well, now 2 Peter, where we're looking at this morning. 2 Peter, the first chapter, again verses 5 through 7. Read it with me again. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Now, when I first put those three verses together, it was interesting to me because... Notice what we put down here. Let's fill in these blanks. <clears throat> it says love, agape love, should be blank, blank, and blank in between. Well, noticing these verses, let me suggest this. Love, agape love, should be first. At first blank, fill in first. That next blank, last. And then that third blank, and everywhere in between. That's really what we've just looked at. In Galatians 5, verse 22, love begins that list. It's first. But in 1 Timothy 6, and verse 11, it's right there in the middle. And then in 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 7, it brings up the end because it's the crowning virtue. It's the crowning grace. So love ought to be first, last, and everywhere in between. I was in a Bible study one time, pretty recently, and the man was talking about First uh, <clears throat> Peter, I mean Second Peter, the first chapter, and he made a, a big emphasis on love rounding out 
that list 